All right, Shalom. Uh, so I was trying to come up with a, a title for this presentation, and I settled on the, the question, are you compromised? Who do your thoughts come from? Now notice I didn't say where do your thoughts come from. I said who do your thoughts come from? And I was thinking about this, this statement that Yeshua made to Kepha in Matthew 16, 23. It says that Yeshua turned and said to Kepha, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for your thoughts are not those of Elohim, but those of men. So, Yeshua is pointing out these two different types of thoughts. There's the thoughts of Elohim, there's the thoughts of, of mankind. And that brought me back to Isaiah 55, where it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are my, your ways my ways, declares Yahuwah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And the psalmist says in Psalm 139, How precious are your thoughts to me, O El! How great has been the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more than the sand. Search me, O El, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if an idolatrous way is in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. <clears throat> you know, we're getting our thoughts from a lot of different directions nowadays. You know, with the media, and with the internet, television, movies, news programs, just television shows, even, even things that you would think as benign as a sitcom, is there to mold your thoughts and to, in a lot of ways, turn your thoughts in a different direction than what the Scripture, or what the Creator, or what Yeshua wants your thoughts to be. There was a, an actually a very <clears throat> candid statement made this week on MSNBC where one of the uh, newscasters, Micah Brzezinski, the daughter of... Uh, Brzezignu Brzezinski, if I pronounce his name right, she said that Trump is trying to undermine the media and make up his own facts, and it could be that while unemployment and the economy worsens, he could have undermined the messaging so much that he can actually control what people think, and that's our job. So here you have even the media saying that it's their job, it's not their job to bring us the news, it's, it's their job to control our thoughts. So who's controlling our thoughts? And how would we be able to find the truth if your thoughts are all based on a lie? You know, if your thoughts are coming from MSNBC or your thoughts are coming from, you know, some, some movie that you saw last night where they're trying to lead you in a particular direction, how can you really know what the truth is? <clears throat> and how pervasive is the lie. It's this quote by John Adams, facts are stubborn things and <clears throat> whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passion, they cannot alter the state of the facts and evidence. Ben Shapiro says something very similar. He says that facts don't care about your fe uh, feelings. So what are the facts? What is the truth? How do we see through the lies and, and get through where we've been led. When I first started studying the scripture, I came to this verse in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 16, 19 says, O Yahuwah, my strength and my stronghold and my refuge, in the day of distress the Gentiles shall come to you from the end of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited only falsehood, futility, and there is no value in them. And so this when I was reading this, I kind of paused and, and was contemplating that because I'd also been noticing that a lot of the things I'm reading, I was reading at the time in the Torah, was not lining up with the religious system that I was brought up in. So I stopped and I, I, I googled this verse to, to see what other people had to say about it. And what I saw was a whole lot of finger pointing. You know, the... the the Protestants were pointing the finger at the Catholics and saying, see, this is, they're the ones that inherited all the lies. And, the, you know, the Catholics are pointing at the Jews and saying they inherited all the lies. And the Jews are pointing at the pagans and, 
you know, everybody was, the pagans are pointing back at the, at the, you know, Christianity saying that they're the ones that are engrossed in lies. And so all this finger pointing, and I went back and reread the verse, and it, it says that people are going to be coming from the ends of the earth. It sounded to me like it was all people. It was not just one group. You know, we're always the group that has the truth. Everyone thinks that they have the truth. So, what is the truth? The lie is easy. Mark Twain said that a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. See, the lie is easy, it's comforting. The lie is the tradition. And so, the establishment, the, the religious, political establishment, the, the group that, the, the orthodox, it's all one system. You know, even the opposing sides are, are still synchronized with one another. You know, the, if you look at Orthodox Judaism, Orthodox Christianity, Orthodox Protestantism, <clears throat> Orthodox Catholicism, whatever system it is, like these systems are all meant to pull you in one direction or another. As far as the, the social system goes, it doesn't care if if you are pulled into Judaism or pulled into Christianity or even Islam. It doesn't care. What they don't want is they don't want you outside of the system. They don't want you outside of the 501c3 setup. They don't want you to really find the truth. They do this by redefining words. You know, the, the new thing is you hear a lot of talk about fascism now. Well, fascism is kind of this melding of, of the corporate establishment with the state. So like the corporations and the state become one. That word, of course, has been redefined to whatever group that, that this, you know, the protesters are always opposing fascism. Fascism is just whatever that they're opposed to. It has no definition anymore. You know, Nazism has been redefined. It's no longer about the ideology of Nazism. It's just any group that's opposed to you. You know, theft has been redefined as taxation. Justice and righteousness, how have they been redefined? That's one of the reasons I gave presentations on justice and righteousness. You know, how can we get back to the definition of what that actually meant to Yeshua. How can we get back to what that actually meant when the prophet, and not just Yeshua, when any prophet came to Israel and said that they, they were needing this establishment of justice and righteousness, can we look at our modern day definition of that? I don't think we can. Because justice today, social justice in the 21st century, is something diametrically opposed <clears throat> to Scripture. In the book that some of us in the Yahad have read, the, uh, the name of the book, you know, Jesus' View of His Father, the author says something to me that was kind of profound. He said that in Catholicism, the Pope is infallible. So all authority comes from the Pope. And when the Protestants broke away, they needed their infallible source. Now, the, the, I think the, the more logical, infallible source would have been Yeshua. You know, what is the source that Yeshua gives us in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels? The Spirit of Truth, the Helper that's going to be sent to us. The Holy Spirit was going to be our source of truth. But the Protestants, they, they chose their infallible source of truth to be the Scripture. And so is that what Yeshua would have said was the truth? Would, did he tell us that we could count on the scripture for infallible truth? In John chapter 8, it says that Yeshua said in, chapter 30, in verse 31, he says to the, the Jews who believed in him, 
If you stay in my word, you are truly my taught ones. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So, essentially, if you stay in the word of Yeshua, then you shall know the truth. But later on in this, in this exact same chapter, just 14, 12, 14 verses later, it says, when, the, when he said, made this statement, they turned around and argued with him and said, look, we've been free. What do you mean the truth is going to set us free? We've never been slaves. And Yeshua says, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you wish to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and has not stood in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks the lie, he speaks of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. And because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. And if I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? There's two forces. You know, there's this, the father of lies and the prince of truth. Who do we believe? And the thing is, is that this, the, the scriptures itself, according to Yeshua, is compromised. A lot of that's been written out of the scripture. But if you go through the prophets, you can see that the prophets often would speak about the lying pen of the scribes. And somehow we believe that what we have in our Bibles today, after two to four thousand years of being passed down, stayed pure, that, that nothing was inserted into it. But the apostles and Yeshua taught something much different. In the received text, even in John 5.39, it says, You search the scriptures because you think you possess everlasting life in them, but you do not desire to come to me to possess everlasting life. Yeshua is the truth, the source of truth. It's not the scriptures, it's not the Pope, it's not the pastor. John 18, 37, Pilate said to him, to, said to Yeshua, you are a sovereign then. And Yeshua answered and said, you say it because I am a sovereign. For this I was born and for this I've come into this world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Again, the, the source of truth is Yeshua. In fact, he says that's the, his whole reason for coming into the world is to bear witness to the truth. So, this takes me back to something that Kepha said in the Nazarene Acts, or I'm sorry, it's the Nazarene Homilies, uh, Book 3, Chapter 49. Simon Magus says to him, I understand that you speak of your Yeshua as he of whom the prophecy of the scripture spoke. So let it be granted that it is so. So tell us then how he taught you to discriminate the scriptures. So what did, what did Yeshua teach his apostles on how to discriminate the scriptures? Akifa replies and says he taught that it is a mixture of truth with falsehood. I remember that on one occasion he, finding fault with the Sadducees, said, You are in error, not knowing the true things of the Scriptures. Now this is a little bit different than our received text. In our received text it says, You are in error, not knowing the Scriptures. Or not knowing the things in the Scriptures. But here it says, The true things of the Scriptures. And on this account, you are ignorant of the power of Elohim, but if he laid it on them that they knew not the true things of the scriptures, it is obvious that there are false things in them. And also, inasmuch as he said, be prudent money changers, it is because there are genuine and spurious words. So, prudent money changers. If you were a money changer, you had to know the truth from the counterfeit. If you were exchanging, if you were taking in counterfeit money and giving out real money, you would go broke uh, really quick. So Yeshua commands us to be prudent money changers. And so he said, how do you not perceive that which is reasonable in the scriptures? He makes the understanding of him stronger who voluntarily 
judges soundly. Kepha goes on to say, his word to the scribes and Morim of the existing scriptures as to those who knew the true things of the Torah that then was is well known. And also that he said, I am not come to destroy the Torah, and yet that he appeared to be destroying it is the part of one intimating that the things that he destroyed did not belong in the Torah. So, you know, if you go through the, uh, the Matthew chapter 5, you'll see that Yeshua's drawing lines where he says, you know, you've heard it said this, but I tell you that. And so he's, he's basically saying, you've heard this thing, which would be the false statement, but I tell you the truth, and the truth is this statement. And people say that, well, Yeshua is just, he's preaching against the oral law. You know, he's not, he's not preaching against the Torah, he's preaching against the oral law, but Yeshua does say, you've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Well, that's not the oral law, that's in the Torah. And Yeshua's saying, but I say to you, justice, mercy, and forgiveness, that you know, you don't need to take this eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. And, and uh, going on, the second paragraph there on the screen, it says, and he's saying, the heavens and the earth will pass away, but not one, uh, the least letter of punctuation mark will pass from the Torah, intimated that the things which pass away before the heaven and the earth do so, do not belong in the Torah in the first place. So it's a statement from Matthew 5.17. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not a yod or tittle will pass from the, from the law to all is fulfilled. But yet things have passed away. Since then, while the heaven and the earth still stand, sacrifices have passed away, and kingdoms and prophecies among those who are born of women. That would be the, uh, the false prophets. And such like is not being ordinances of Elohim. Hence, therefore, he says, every plant which the heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. For he, being the true prophet, said, I am the gate of, the, of life. He who enters by me enters into life, there being no other teaching able to save. Furthermore, also he cried and said, Come unto me, all who labor, that is, who are seeking the truth, and not finding it. And again, my sheep hear my voice, and elsewhere seek and find. And this is important. It says, since the truth does not lie on the surface. But that's not what we've been told. We've been led to believe the truth is easy to find. Well, you just read the Bible. You just need to go and read this passage in Scripture. And you'll get the truth. It's easy to find. But Kepha says that Yeshua taught him that the truth does not lie on the surface. But also a witnessing voice was heard from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And in addition to this, willingly to convict more fully of error the prophets from whom they asserted that they had learned, he proclaimed that they died desiring truth, but not having learned it saying, Many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and to hear what you hear, and verily I say to you, they neither saw nor heard. Still further, he said, I am concerning, I am he concerning whom Moses prophesied, saying, A prophet will um, Yahuwah our Elohim raise unto you of your brothers like unto me. Hear him in all things. Whoever does not hear that prophet will die. From that we know that it is impossible without his teaching, to attain to saving truth, though one seek it forever, where the thing that is sought is not, but it was and is in the word of our Yeshua. <clears throat> so, according to Kepha, the only source of truth is the teachings of Yeshua. And unfortunately, I don't think that all of his teachings can be found in the four Gospels in our received text of Scripture. There's obviously other doctrines he taught. There's other things that he taught. There's, there's still the, the, the pebbles laying beneath the surface that you can find in the received text, but we have to go to the other sources. We have to 
figure out what was it the Ebionites taught, what was it the Nazarenes believed, what did they get from him. You know, there's a lot of truth in the Nazarene Acts. In there, Kepha says that if I were to teach anything contrary to what Yeshua taught, that would make me a false teacher. And so, at the beginning of the Nazarene Acts, he, he swears that he will only teach, and he can only teach, what Yeshua taught him. You know, there's a parable in Scripture, the parable of the sower, that I believe. I believe it's been altered to, to make the parable seem to apply to, to people. That that the, the the serpent came in and planted this false seed among the good seed, and that um, that those would actually be people. But I don't think that's the case. Because in the very next verse, in the next chapter, Yeshua says that it's, it's not for everyone to know the meaning of these parables. And then he's, he proceeds to tell the meaning of the parable. Well, the very meaning that Yeshua said was not to be shared, are we to, to think that the apostles shared it with everyone? Because <laughs> every time I read that, I think that that's weird that he would tell them that this is some understanding that he's trying to to get across secretly, but yet they're going to tell it to everyone. So, like, billions of people since then have known what this secret was. So he tells us not to not to pull up the tares, because you might root out the wheat with it. So we can't go in and start, you know, pulling lines out of the Bible that we disagree with. But I do think that he does expect us to have discernment when we study and to question ourselves. Where do our thoughts come from? Are we reading the scripture through our own eyes or are we reading it through someone else's? There's a statement that we hear a lot in the Hebrew Roots movement that, well, you just don't understand the scripture because you, you don't understand the Hebraic context of it. Or you don't understand Paul because he was a rabbi and, and you just don't have this Hebrew mindset. But that's just, that's just become something we're programmed to say. I hear it all the time. You'll state the, the plain meaning of text in Scripture, and, and somebody comes back and says, well, you know, if you knew the Hebraic understanding of this, there's a dagesh under this syllable, and that tells you that it means the exact opposite of what every translator says. But where are those thoughts coming from? Are we protecting the orthodoxy? Usually people that make those statements, they're, they're making them because you're going against what they've been taught. See, they don't want to see the plain meaning of the text. They don't want to know what was the actual words of Yeshua. You search the scriptures because you think that they have everlasting life, but you don't desire to come to me. One of the things that's really been impressed upon me lately is just trying to get back to what Yeshua believed. It doesn't matter what, what it, you know, we have to view all of Scripture through the mouth of what Yeshua told us. What did he say? What was it that his actual apostles said? You know, it doesn't matter, you know, the facts don't care about your feelings. They don't care that you feel like, you know, Paul says some beautiful words or, you know, Paul was so eloquent in his, in his letters, and you feel like that they have to be the truth. You feel like it, that Yeshua or Yahuwah would not let anything false go into Scripture because you just feel like that he would not do that. Well, the facts don't care about your feelings. And the truth is going to set you free, but you have to be willing to receive the truth. Okay, well, that's my message. Thank you for listening. Shalom.